My name is Dorothy Kobe Berry, and I was born in Aspen, Colorado, July 22nd, 1905. I just had my 100th birthday plus six months. I think the Jewish businesses did so well because of their strong family connections. And they were all hard workers. Go west, young man, and grow up with the country. These famous words were penned in 1851 by Indiana newspaper man John Soule and later adapted by Horace Greeley, the influential editor of the New York Tribune. When they encourage Western migration, it is unlikely that either Soule or Greeley envisioned the number of adventurous Jewish men and women who would not only make their way west in search of opportunity, but settle in Colorado to become among the state's most innovative and successful entrepreneurs. Colorado was still an untamed wilderness when the discovery of gold near Pikes Peak in 1858 brought the area to the nation's attention. By the spring of 1859, fortune seekers began to arrive in droves and use the rifle infant camps of Denver and Auraria as jumping off points. Jews also took part in the quest. During the big excitement, as the year of the gold discovery was called, at least 12 Jews of German descent migrated to Colorado to join in the hunt for freedom, new opportunities, and wealth. The unpredictability of gold mining and a growing demand for supplies encouraged many of the Jewish 1859ers to establish small businesses in new towns and mining camps throughout Colorado. Their arrival marked the beginning of Colorado's Jewish community. Mining was instrumental to the early development of the pioneer Jewish community in Colorado, although only a small number of Jews were miners themselves. Many more were suppliers to the miners, sometimes serving as peddlers, traders, or more often as small shopkeepers in nascent settlements. Before long, stores run by Jewish merchants and family members in search of work and wealth flourished on the main streets of most Colorado towns, including Denver, Central City, Leadville, Trinidad, Irwin, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, and Fairplay. Despite their distinction as a religious minority, pioneer Jews in communities throughout Colorado were viewed as a positive and stabilizing influence, who upheld morality and order in the new settlements, as well as bringing a measure of culture to the rough frontier. As the early pioneer men married, often importing their brides from back east. And as children were born, the fledgling towns of the west began to stabilize. The first Rosh Hashanah service in Denver was held in 1859. However, it wasn't until the 1870s that these Jewish pioneer men and women were finding more time to confront the task of building an organized Jewish community. And Colorado's Jewish businessmen and later women were in the forefront. From the beginning, many of these early enterprises were a family effort involving kinship ties and the support of relatives. One of the first Jewish pioneers was Fred Zadig Solomon, who arrived in Auraria in June of 1859. 
In short order, he became the manager of the first General Mercantile Company in Colorado. In partnership with a non-Jewish partner, J.B. Doyle, the Prussian-born Solomon began the enterprise with $30,000 worth of goods. Fred's brother Hyman was instrumental in bringing supplies to the South Park, Colorado mining district near Fairplay. And the two were later joined by a third brother, Adolf, who became a trustee of the early Greeley, Colorado colony. The Solomon brothers and other Jewish 1859ers contributed to the state's political and cultural life as well. The relative absence of anti-Semitism and the fluid social structure in the newly established Colorado boomtowns enabled many of the Jewish pioneers to enter politics and society with more ease than Jews had known in other areas. Fred served as an early Denver City Councilman, as did another of the early Jewish pioneers, merchant Leopold Mayer, who traveled 600 miles by foot beside his ox team to enter Denver that first year. Mayer later established a store and bank in Sawatch. They were typical of the first Jewish settlers in the region, young men, usually unmarried, and of German descent, entering businesses dealing with the distribution of goods. These men brought to Colorado skills in merchandising and commerce, which had been developed over the ages by their European Jewish ancestors. The open and expanding American economy before and after the Civil War contributed to the success of these enterprising German Jews, as did Jewish networks of credit stretching back to the East Coast. Fred Solomon, a popular figure in early Denver society, was elected treasurer of the Chamber of Commerce in 1860, and in 1879 would be listed as one of the incorporators of the Colorado Historical Society. When the Territory of Colorado was formally established on February 28, 1861, Fred was in Washington for the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. He was also a founder of the Denver and Auraria Chest and Literary Society, along with fellow pioneer Abraham Jacobs. The German-born Jacobs arrived in Denver in June of 1859, opening a grocery store with a non-Jewish partner, Albert Boudy. It was Jacobs who served as the secretary of the famous 1860 Moonlight Meeting when the towns of Denver and Auraria were united under the name of Denver City. Jacobs later moved his store for a time to Central City and went into partnership with merchant Benjamin Weisbart. Weisbart was elected mayor of Central City in 1876 and also became Jacobs' brother-in-law when Abraham married Francis Weisbart in 1863. Francis Weisbart Jacobs became nationally known as Denver's Mother of Charities and the impetus behind the founding of National Jewish Hospital for Consumptives. In 1865, Charles M. Shire came with his bride Ricca to the growing community of Denver by covered wagon. He came to join his brother Simon and established the Shire Wholesale Wine and Liquor business with a branch in the silver boom town of Leadville. After arriving in Denver, uh, my grandfather established a wholesale wine and liquor business, servicing the mountain areas of Aspen, Cripple Creek, Leadville, uh, and the other mountain communities. Uh, and he delivered his stock of goods by horse and wagon, and they made, I would guess, a monthly trip to the mountains. A few years after arriving here, he sent back to Europe for his nephew, Adolf, who came here and went to Leadville, which at that time was the main, main business point of Colorado, and they opened a distillery. We were fortunate enough to find under a house in Georgetown this mug, which was a mug of the Shire Mercantile Company on Harrison Avenue in Leadville, which was the mercantile establishment of the nephew of my father. Like so many of the early entrepreneurs, Charles Shire took a prominent role in Colorado's Jewish community and served as an early lay rabbi of Congregation Emmanuel. The Shire name was to be interwoven into the thread of Colorado Jewish history over five generations. 
Louis Onfanger was also typical of the young Jewish men who migrated to Colorado in the state's formative years. Born in Bavaria, Onfanger came to the U.S. in the 1850s and moved west in 1870 to seek his fortune. Onfanger started as a clerk and became a highly successful businessman in the area of real estate, as well as a member of the Chamber of Commerce, and later serving in the state legislature. He was a Republican and in 1894 was elected to the Colorado legislature. I have here a telegram he sent to his son Milton, who was a student at Stanford University. This advises Milton of his election. He says, Colorado, all right, am elected, as is the entire ticket. And it's signed formally, Louis Onfanger. Onfanger built a stately house on Champa and 29th Street for his wife Louise and large family. He too became an active member of the Jewish community, serving as a founder of Congregation Emmanuel, B'nai B'rith, and the National Jewish Hospital. Jewish entrepreneurs fanned out across other towns in the state. In Trinidad in 1867, Maurice Wise opened a thriving general store, and Sam and Henry Jaffa, owners of the newly established Jaffa Mercantile Company, conducted high holiday services for the small Jewish community in 1872. Kobe's Men's Store in Aspen became a city hallmark, and the Kobe's were leaders in the early mining community. Leadville hosted a Ladies' Hebrew Benevolent Society and B'nai B'rith chapter in the 1870s when silver discoveries thrust the community into prosperity. By 1892, Leadville had both a Reform and Orthodox synagogue. Jewish-owned businesses in the Leadville area, like the German-born Leopold Goldman's Golden Eagle and David May's May Company thrived. He was a friend of David May's, and they <clears throat> were very friendly, but they had different business philosophies because he believed in cash, and David May was smarter and believed in credit, so the May Companies have survived where the Golden Eagle didn't. Leopold Goldman was one of Colorado's leading pioneer entrepreneurs and philanthropist. Goldman came to Colorado in 1870 in search of silver, but found it more profitable to open the Golden Eagle clothing stores in Leadville and Cripple Creek. In 1879, he moved to Denver and opened the third and most successful Golden Eagle enterprise. For many years, Denver's leading popular price department store. Oh. My grandfather, L. H. Goldman, Leopold H. Goldman, was a philanthropist of the first order. He started so many organizations and supported so many. And one of the interesting ones is that he gave his daughter for her 18th birthday the Louise Goldman Community Center on the west side because she liked to read to the children and direct plays. And that was the seed money that was used for what we know now as our great Jewish community center. Attracted by Colorado's reputation as the World Sanatorium, David May had moved to the state for his health, but like so many Jewish immigrants, found prosperity as well. Born in Germany in 1848, May opened his first clothing store in Leadville in 1877 where he and his partners sold Levi's and long red woolen underwear. Soon he opened other branches in Irwin, Central City, and Denver. David went into partnership with the Schoenberg brothers and cemented the relationship when he married their sister, Rosa. The couple became the parents of four children, Morton J., Tom, Wilbur, and Florence. The May Company evolved into one of the largest department store chains in the country. David May, too, was active in the Denver Jewish community through the work of National Jewish Hospital and Temple Emanuel. Leadville was also the birthplace of one of the greatest family fortunes in American history. Meyer Guggenheim, the patriarch of the family, purchased a half interest in two lead and silver mines, the AY and Mini 
for $5,000. By 1890, that investment was valued at $15 million. Meyer's son, Simon Guggenheim, was to become a United States Senator from Colorado and a major supporter of National Jewish Hospital. On a much smaller scale, Sam Cohen built a thriving business career in the small mining town of Fairplay. Uh, like all those early settlers, Jewish settlers, uh, he was a peddler going from mine to mine, peddling goods, and um, finally opened up a store in Fairplay in 1872, which burned down and uh, rebuilt in 1874, and that store is still standing in fair play. As is common with most, uh, most Jewish settlers, they, were not, they did not do the actual mining, but were inter interested in grub staking young miners. Uh, by grub staking, I mean that they would supply the young miners with all the mining supplies for a portion of that mine. And in doing so, my grandfather acquired uh, a, a large number of mining properties up in Park County. Max and Ed Newstetter were two prominent Colorado businessmen who migrated to Colorado for health reasons and were later joined by their brother Meyer. They first settled in Estes Park, then in 1911 moved to Denver and founded the successful, high-fashion, Newsteaders Clothing Store. And Newsteaders was the number one store in town. And they were terrific. They had a wonderful reputation. In 1948, Meyer's son, Myron, took over the helm of the Newsteader Company, and he continued to grow the store's reputation for elegant women's clothing, also introducing clothes for girls and young women as well. Yes, it was a always a quality business, and uh, they believed in uh, giving the public the best they could, the best that was being produced at the time. Chasing the cure for tuberculosis also brought Philip Miller, the founder of Miller & Company, to Denver in 1919. Phil's brothers back in New York City owned the Miller Hat Company and Denver became a perfect site in which to expand Phil's early business as a traveling salesman. Beginning with hats, he expanded his merchandise to a variety of Western wear clothing, including boots and jeans. Eventually, the firm began manufacturing its own products and developed a catalog business, operating both as a wholesale supplier and retail operation. Now known as Miller International, the Miller Stockman store was one of the most successful of its kind in the West. And for some time, its headquarters were in the former Golden Eagle store in Denver. European Jewish immigrant Adolf Kiesler also became a noted Colorado philanthropist, but his origins were modest. Born in Romania in 1880, Kiesler settled in Denver's West Colfax Jewish neighborhood at the turn of the century, where he began as a peddler he later recalled, I worked for 15 cents a day at odd jobs. Then I got the job carrying coal for 75 cents a ton. Like so many immigrants, he scrimped and saved and after 15 years and a variety of jobs, he had saved enough money to launch the Peerless Alloy Company in 1909. By the end of the 1950s, operating under his motto, money is made to give away. He had contributed almost $2 million to local Jewish and community institutions, such as Beth Israel Hospital, the JCRS, the Allied Jewish Community Fund, and the University of Denver, and was a staunch supporter of the early state of Israel. Many other East European Jewish immigrants also soon played a critical part in the state's economic development. Robert Laser Miller arrived in Colorado in 1881 from Lithuania and developed a wholesale ranching business in the northern part of the state before he and his brother Joseph Miller opened a meat market on Denver's Blake Street. His experience in the cattle business vaulted him to the position of chief buyer for K&B Packing Company and he was a fixture on horseback at the Denver Stockyards until he died at the age of 96 in 1940. My father 
Robert Laser Miller was uh, one of the founders of uh, in the stockyards, and uh, I think he was the only Jewish man amongst them. And he got up very early. He'd get up four and five to get to the stockyards, so he could uh, see how the prices were going. They were made early, but you couldn't give a price until eight o'clock in the morning. Lewis Robinson had immigrated from Europe to Colorado and established the first Robinson Dairy Farm in 1885. It was a family business with sons Morris and Hyman. Lewis was also a vital force in the development of the Jewish Consumptives Relief Society in 1904. In fact, Robinson donated the land on which the JCRS dairy and poultry farm was developed. Following in Hyman's footsteps, Sam Robinson was responsible for the transformation of the Robinson Farm Climax Dairy into the Gold Seal Dairy. And in 1947, Sam's two sons, Richard and Edward, joined with their father to form the Robinson Dairy, which remained a family enterprise for five generations. The Judlovitz family arrived in Denver in 1888 via Latvia, Lithuania, and New York City. Abraham Judlovitz became a well-known builder, contractor, and developer and for many years volunteered his services on behalf of the JCRS and was instrumental in the construction of the BMH Synagogue Building at 16th and Gaylord, the Congress and Mayflower Hotels, the Interstate Trust Building and the Ex-Patients Home, among many others. Abraham's son Samuel Judd was trained as an engineer and architect and began working for the United States Bureau of Reclamation in 1918. His first project was the landmark Boulder Dam and Power Plant, now known as Hoover Dam. Samuel volunteered his expertise as an architect to design many buildings in the Jewish community, such as the early BMH synagogue that his father built and the first Hebrew Educational Alliance building on Denver's west side. Samuel's son, E. James Judd, took a degree in building construction from the University of Denver and founded his own successful construction business in 1949. He also took a leading role in community affairs, serving as a president of Historic Denver, the Jewish Community Center, and the Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Denver. Samuel's other son, William, was a professor of engineering at Purdue University and founded the Western branch of the National Ski Patrol. He also authored the Red Cross Safety Manual on First Aid for skiers caught in emergency situations. In 1906, Lulu and Henry Frankel Sr. opened the Frankel Stationery at 16th and Larimer. Henry worked in the store from the beginning, but after completing law school and the death of Henry Sr., Henry Frankel Jr. took over the business in 1914 at the age of 22. In 1915, he changed the focus of the enterprise and initiated the Frankel Manufacturing Company, which produced typewriter ribbons as its first product. It evolved into one of the largest firms of its kind in the world. In the early 1900s, Jesse Schwader opened a small luggage factory with his father, Isaac, and brothers Mark, Morris, Benjamin, and Solomon. And together, they turned it into one of the largest luggage producers in America the Samsonite Corporation. From the beginning, the success of the early Schwader enterprise was based in large part on a supportive extended family network. The saga begins with the story of Alexander Rittmaster, who was born in Poland in 1830 and emigrated to America to escape oppression in Europe. Attracted by the promise of economic opportunity, he traveled by covered wagon to Central City in the early 1860s beginning as a peddler in Blackhawk and Nevadaville. Soon he was successful enough to open a dry goods store in Central City in 1865. At the same time, he encouraged and helped a number of relatives in Europe to come join him. First came his nephews from Poland, Abraham, Harry, and Jacob Levi, followed by many cousins including David Lewis, Isaac Abraham, and Jacob, Nathan, Noah, and Gabriel Lewis Rachowski 
all of whom eventually operated dry goods and clothing businesses in Colorado towns. Another cousin, Abraham Rachofsky, arrived in about 1867 and became one of Central City's most prominent merchants. By 1900, his New York store, Mercantile Company, employed nine clerks. He also became an original stockholder in the famous Central City Opera House. In the meantime, Rittmaster's niece, Miriam Rychowski Kobe, and her husband, Samuel Abraham, had moved to England, where their daughter Rachel married Isaac Schwader, a Jewish scholar from Eastern Europe. They too were soon encouraged to seek their fortunes in the New World. In 1879, Isaac Schwader arrived in Central City, where he first worked for Abe Rychowski, and then opened his own store in Nevadaville. Isaac was later joined by his wife and two small children. Miriam and Samuel Abraham Kobe and their children also migrated to America, first to New Jersey and then to Colorado, where many members of the Kobe family established businesses in Aspen and Marble. My Uncle Bam had the Kobe Shoe and Clothing Company, and my father had the HK Trading Company, Harris Kobe Trading Company. And don't forget, Aspen was a mining town, so merchants were very important. In Denver, Leon, Silas, and Philip Kobe opened Kobe Shoestring Potato Company, earning a national reputation. Before long, Rachel Schwader convinced her husband Isaac to move to the larger community of Denver, where he first opened a grocery store at 11th and Market and later a furniture store, where the family began to make trunks as a sideline. Business was modest at first, but Isaac and Rachel's second son, Jesse, born in Blackhawk in 1882, and his brothers launched the expanded trunk enterprise with a small factory on Santa Fe Drive. In 1918, the Schwader's Growing Luggage Company became a nationally recognized brand when they introduced a new strong and inexpensive suitcase. By 1923, they had expanded to an 80,000 square foot plant on South Broadway. In their advertising campaign, the Schwaders demonstrated that their luggage was strong enough to stand on. Hence the name, Samsonite. Jesse served as the first president of the company followed by his son, King David Schwader, and then his nephew, Irving Schwader. The Schwader family also believed in giving back to the community and supported a number of Jewish and Denver charitable enterprises. Morris Schwader was a founder of General Rose Hospital, and the Jesse and Nellie Schwader Geriatric Center was located at Beth Israel Hospital and Home. Family members also sponsored the Schwader Art Building, and Solomon Schwader Judaic Collection at the University of Denver, the Morris Schwader Camp, the Schwader Theater at the Denver Jewish Community Center, and the Nellie Schwader Pediatric Pavilion at National Jewish Hospital. Jesse Schwader was also noted for his famous golden marble, engraved with an appropriate motto for ethical business practice, which proclaimed, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In 1954, the University of Denver awarded Jesse an honorary Doctor of Public Service degree in recognition of his community leadership. Abraham Bernard Hirschfeld was born in 1888 in Cincinnati, Ohio to Russian Jewish parents. Nineteen years later in 1907, A.B. as he was known, took his passion for printing and a small $35 hand press and turned them into one of the largest printing businesses in the Rocky Mountain region. A.B.'s son, Edward, born in that fateful year of 1907, followed in his father's footsteps, beginning work at the age of 12. The A.B. Hirschfeld Press was founded in the basement of a small store in 17th and Larimer, before moving to much larger spaces, first in 1915 to 19th and Broadway, and then in 1923, the company moved to 1840 California Street. A.B. was not only a successful entrepreneur,
but an active member of Colorado's Jewish community and a civic leader. One Denver newspaper dubbed him the Gutenberg of Denver. In 1935, A.B. was elected to serve as Colorado State Senator, a position he held until 1941. His innovative spirit led him to help co-found KBTV Channel 9 in 1950, when Denver television was in its infancy. For almost 100 years, A.B. Hirschfeld Press was one of the largest family-owned and operated printing businesses in the Rocky Mountain region. In 2005, Hirschfeld Press merged with National Printing and Packaging Company to become the National Hirschfeld LLC, with Barry Hirschfeld, A.B.'s grandson, serving as chairman of the new combined company. While Colorado Jewish women had sometimes worked alongside their husbands in family businesses or ran small stores on their own, Hannah Levy was probably one of the first to take a central role in a major commercial enterprise. Hannah and Jack Levy, German Jewish immigrants, arrived in Denver in the 1920s, soon becoming leading Colorado business proprietors. Hannah began as a shop girl in Denver's Newsteader store, and her brother Jack worked for his uncle at Hilbin Company as a jobber or traveling salesman. Before long, the two opened their own shop, the Hosiery Bar on Curtis Street, with Emmett Heitler as a partner. Heitler later became an executive vice president of Samsonite before retiring in 1974. The Hosiery Bar later evolved into the Fashion Bar, and by 1936, the Levies were running five stores, two in Denver, one in Colorado Springs, the others in Pueblo and Greeley. Hannah served as chief buyer for Fashion Bar, often traveling to New York and Europe to order fashionable clothing. I was always in, in merchandise. I was always 100% occupied with the merchandise. He was always 100%, never went to Europe with the leases and the landlords, and which is really much more difficult. So it, it, it was step by step, uh, it's, 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 uh, it just develops. You're on your toes and you're alert and you're aware, and so uh, things just develop once you get going. Contrary to the uh, formula that's been extremely successful for most successful businesses in the retail field, we decided to stay in Colorado. Despite the Great Depression, the enterprise flourished and continued to expand in size and scope. Later, businessman Bill Wheel became an active member of the Fashion Bar team as chairman of the board and both of Jack's sons, Bob and John, served as presidents of the company. By the 1980s, Fashion Bar employed over 1,700 people in over 80 stores. One of the divisions was named Hannah, after its co-founder. Hannah, Jack, and their younger brother Edward, as well as the extended family, supported numerous Jewish, civic, and cultural causes, including Rose Hospital and the University of Denver and helped countless individuals on a personal basis. Colorado Jewish businessman Jack A. Weil moved to Denver in the 1920s and became a pioneer in the Western wear industry. In 1933, he entered into a partnership with Philip Miller and helped grow the Miller Company significantly. In 1946, Jack left to open his own business Rock Mount Ranch Ware. Yet he and Miller remained good friends, and the Miller catalog even carried shirts produced by Rock Mount for many years. Jack A. Weil is credited with introducing the first commercially made Western shirt with diamond shaped snap buttons and sawtooth pocket flaps, and the first commercially produced bolo ties. Today, at the age of 105, Jack A. Weil still goes to work every day with his son Jack B and grandson Steve. The slogan at Rockmount is we put the snap in Western shirts. My grandfather, Jack A. Weil, made the first shirts with snaps. And we are the longest producing company of snap shirts as a result. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the Western apparel business largely 
started in Denver and uh, in this neighborhood Rock, where Rockmount's located on Wazee Street, there were several companies. Uh, many of them are gone um, and we are the last remaining Western Wear company or for that matter early mercantile company in Lodo. So the three generations at Rockmount reflect the spread of the popularity of Western Wear around the world. Uh, I've always said that the West was a state of mind. That uh, it was not a geographic line at all. Part of that state of mind, while referred to, was a pervading sense of optimism about the many possibilities available in the region. From the very beginning, Colorado provided a welcoming environment for its Jewish citizens, who made important contributions to the wider society, as well as developing their own vibrant Jewish community. Their success was facilitated by Jewish networks of support that often extended back to the East Coast, as relatives and friends helped finance their initial start. For nearly 150 years, Colorado Jewish entrepreneurs have played an integral part of our state's development and helped shape the contours of the region's development. Not only did they succeed in business, but they played a pivotal role in growing Colorado and the American West. <music>